I am excited to be sitting down today to discuss how to make a case for TARS defensibility with different roles, including internal teams, clients, opposing counsel, courts, and regulators. Let's set the stage here on a general level. Why are some organizations hesitant to use TAR? I think there's a fear that things are going to get missed, that they don't know how it works, um, that if they choose to go this way and they miss something, they're not looking at the same situation that they would be if a, a group of attorneys that were hired or that were in-house turned around and looked at something and said, this is what we found. They just assume that it is this black box. And I feel like the questions have changed slightly. We're no longer getting questions about or suspicions about this being a black box. There are more nuanced questions and hesitation in using them. So in my mind, if I list out some of the key concerns that I'm hearing about, it's mostly around or like a misconception about TAR can only be used for data culling, for example, that lawyers, for example, they, they think that they have to be TAR geniuses or math experts. And first, I really want to, you know, kind of emphasize that making a case for the use of TAR goes beyond just someone's role, whether that's your colleague, your client, the courts, or a regulator. There's a lot of other factors to consider. Their technology proficiency, their understanding of TAR, to your point, the relationship you have with the individuals. So we're really going to just take an overall general approach to talking about this here, but we understand there are a lot more factors that go into the conversation and the reception of the use of TAR when you're talking with individuals. Deepak, why don't we start with, with you. When you're talking to peer or colleague about one of their projects and the use of TAR, what have you seen helpful when convincing those internal teams to use TAR? Besides educating them, which can be a slow and a long process, I think for people who are still on the fence about it, I've found that starting with some simple or basic uh, use cases that allows them to get some experience under their belt and build some familiarity with TAR really helps. So for example, you know, let them use TAR to just prioritize documents for review, even if it's an eyes on every doc type review and there is no culling involved at all, but that can still yield dramatic results. Over time, if we track the results and like put the metrics together, the benefits are just clear. And you know, when they when they actually see that in use, they start to believe and really want to use it on every matter. That's great. So now you've convinced your colleagues. Now they have to talk about this with their clients, which is a different you know skill set and and perhaps conversation in, in general. So. Danielle, I suspect you talk with your clients quite a bit about the use of TAR and in particular TAR's defensibility. So it's that, uh, that age old question, who is your client though, right? Um, <laughs> and it depends. Sometimes you have a point person at the client who is a business stakeholder and not even an attorney. Other times you have general counsel and general counsel can be, in-house counsel can be made up of so many different things. You can have a client that has a full e-discovery department as part of their regular working, dealing with litigations, regulatory filings, whatever, that type of client is gonna be a lot more familiar. Other times you have a client who's a startup and doesn't even have an in-house counsel. I think it's really good to get them involved. If it's, if it's a known group, you can show them a sample of something, you can look at a certain scope and they can see that it's working really easily. If it's, not a, if it's not a group that has a big e-discovery um, group inside and you have someone who's new to litigation or new to e-discovery, then you have to be um, a, a little bit more involved with how they can see that it works. But I, I do think going back to what um, Deepak had said earlier, you have to show people that it works though. Probably the more challenging conversation. What about the conversation with opposing counsel? Same thing. It's, it's more challenging and it's less challenging, right? It depends. You have opposing counsel that um, does a lot of large complex matters, uses e-discovery all the time. It's going to be a lot easier to come up with the TAR protocol with those teams than it is uh, with someone who maybe is a smaller practice 
and does not is not very familiar with it. We've talked about talking with our teams and clients and opposing counsel. Mentioned the next one, which is the courts. Deepak, what do you um, you know usually ask, or um, what do the courts, I should say, ask you when it comes to using TAR? You know, what have you found successful when discussing its defensibility? So we talk to uh, the case team and the clients and the counsel a lot about like it's not just technology; it, it is about the process and the people. Uh, you know, and based on the recent case law and practical trends, you know, it's pretty clear that. Yeah, the party that wants to use TAR as a search process, you know, may choose to use it. The courts we've seen, you know, generally promotes transparency, like it really encourages parties to be upfront and transparent about the process uh, and demonstrate a reasonable and proportional search process and the result. That is to say that use of TAR does not mean that it should be perfect, you know, it, it should be reasonable. I think the key questions that we always discuss with the, the parties when it comes to defensibility is, what is the overall narrative for the court? And that boils down to A, whether the platform is approved and, you know, does uh, machine learning in a defensible way and what, what the process is around the platform, B, does your search process demonstrate completeness, you know, in a reasonable way? And C, can you validate or have you validated the whole process based on statistics and expert defense? Generally, in your role, and I think you, you talk with regulators on a regular basis, <laughs> double thing there. What are you seeing when talking to regulators about TAR? Do you see differences in their acceptance of it or understanding of its defensibility? I think acceptance is there generally, because when you're talking about regulators and you've got a government entity that, you know, goes through a, a set of processes, the expectation is very often that these are large matters, they want a lot of data, and, you know, they have a standard set of specifications that they would like to see. And very often, most of the government entities have their standard specs and they include provisions for TAR. So as an entity, each of the government regulators accepts it generally. But I think this is the same kind of a problem that you have when I said, who is your client? Because individual case teams may or may not ever have used it, may not understand even what their entity's specifications require um, or why. And I think why is the big problem, right? So, you know, even when you have government entity teams that understand that TAR is going to be used in a case, that's the expectation. There's going to be millions of documents, maybe in a, in a large investigation, and that you know there's a there's a TAR protocol or there's specifications from the government. I think very often you have a case team that doesn't understand even if they understand what, what's supposed to happen and from a transparency standpoint, the type of reports that are supposed to get and whatever, they might not understand why or what that means. And I think that that very much impacts your ability to continue to move forward in that case. Danielle Deepak, thanks so much for joining. I really appreciate it and had a tremendous time talking with you.